Act One of Tartuffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tartuffe or the Hypocrite by Jean Baptiste Poquelon Molière. Translated by Curtis Hidden Page. Characters Madame Panel, read by Hippo Gonzales. Orgon, read by Adam. Elmire, read by Valerie Tan. Damus, read by Uday Sagor. Marianne, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Cliente, recording by Sitat. Tartuffe, read by Todd. Doreen, read by Amanda Friday. Mr. Loyal, read by David Lawrence. The Police Officer, read by Grace Garrett. Stage directions read by Laurie Ann Walden. The scene is at Paris. Scene one. Madame Purnell and Flippot, her servant, Elmire, Marianne, Cléant, Damis, Doreen. Come, come, Flippote, and let me get away. You hurry so, I hardly can attend you. Then don't, my daughter-in-law. Stay where you are. I can dispense with your polite attentions. We're only paying what is due you, mother. Why must you go away in such a hurry? Because I can't enjoy your carryings on, and no one takes the slightest pains to please me. I'll leave you a house, I tell you, quite disgusted. You do the opposite of my instructions. You have no respect for anything, each one. Myself, you say, it's perfect pandemonium. If your servant wench, my girl, I'm much too full for gab and too impertinent, and free with your advice in all occasions. But you're a fool, my boy. F-O-O-L. Just spells your name. Let grandma tell you that. I've said a hundred times from my poor son, your father, that you never come to good, or give anything but pagan torment. I think... Oh, dearie me, your little sister. You're all demureness. Better with it melt in your mouth. One more thing to look at you. Still waters, though, they say. You know the proverb, and I don't like your doings on the sly. But, mother... Don't all by your leave, your conduct in everything is altogether wrong. You ought to set a good example for him. As your departed mother did much better. You are extravagant, and it defends me. And you always drag out like a princess, a woman who would please her husband's eyes. Alone. Who wants no such wealth of fineries. But, madam, after all... Sir, ask for you. The lady's brother, I esteem you highly. Love and respect you. But, sir, all the same if I were in my son's, her husband's place, I'd urgently entreat you not to come within our doors. The preacher way of leaving that decent people cannot tolerate. I'm rather frank with you, but that's my way. I don't mean smarters when I mean a thing. Mr. Tartu, your friend, is my lucky. He is a holy man, and must be heeded. I can't endure with any show of patience to have a scut of brains like you attack him. What? Shall I let a bigot critic Astor come and use her but tyrant's power here? And shall we never dare amuse ourselves till this fine gentleman designs to consent? If we must hark to him and heed his maxims, there's not a thing we do but what's a crime. He censures everything, this zealous copper. And all he censures is well censured, too. He wants to guide you all the way to heaven. My son should train you all to love him well. No, madam, look you, nothing, not my father, nor anything, can make me tolerate him. I should believe my feelings not to say so. His actions rouse my wrath at every turn, and I foresee that there must come of it an open rupture with this sneaking scoundrel. Besides, tis downright scandalous to see this unknown upstart master of the house, this vagabond, who hadn't, when he came, shoes to his feet or clothing worth six farthings, and who so far forgets his place as now to censure everything and rule the roost. Hey, mercy sakes alive! Things would go better if all were governed by his pious orders. He passes for a saint in your opinion. In fact, he's nothing but a hypocrite. Just listen to her tongue. I wouldn't trust him, nor yet his Lawrence, without bonds and surety. I don't know what a servant's character may be, but I can guarantee the master a holy man. You hate him and reject him because he tells home fruits to all of you. To sin alone that moves his heart to anger, and heaven's interest is only motive. Of course. But why, especially of late, can he let nobody come near the house? Is heaven offended at a civil call that he should make so great a fuss about it? I'll tell you, if you like, 
just what I think. Pointing to Elmire. Upon my word, he is jealous of our mistress. You hold your tongue and you think what you're saying. He's not to learn censuring this visit. But to more that attends your sort of people, the carriage is forever at the door. And all the noisy footmen flock together, and all the neighbourhood, and raise a scandal. I gladly think that there's nothing really wrong. But it makes talk, and that's not as it should be. Eh, madam, can you hope to keep folks' tongues from wagging? It would be a grievous thing if, for the fear of idle talk about us, we had to sacrifice our friends. No, no, even if we could bring ourselves to do it. Think you that everyone would then be silenced? Against backbiting there is no defence. So let us try to live in innocence, to silly tattle, pay no heed at all, and leave the gossips free to vent their gall. Our neighbour Daphne and her little husband must be the ones who slander us, I'm thinking. Those whose own conduct's most ridiculous are always quickest to speak ill of others. They never fail to seize at once upon the slightest hint of any love affair, and spread the news of it with glee and give it the character they'd have the world believe in. By others' actions, painted in their colours, they hope to justify their own. They think, in the false hope of some resemblance, either to make their own intrigue seem innocent, or else to make their neighbours share the blame which they are loaded with by everybody. These arguments are nothing to the purpose. Rante, we all know, lives a perfect life. The thoughts are all of heaven, and I have heard, as she condemns the company you keep. Oh, admirable pattern! Virtuous dame! She lives the model of austerity. But age has brought this piety upon her, and she's a prude. Now she can't help herself. As long as she could capture men's attentions, she made the most of her advantages. But now she sees her beauty vanishing. She wants to leave the world that's leaving her, and in a specious veil of haughty virtue, She'd hide the weakness of her worn-out charms. That is the way with all your old coquettes. They find it hard to see their lovers leave em, and thus abandoned, their forlorn estate can find no occupation but a prude's. These pious dames, in their austerity, must carp at everything, and pardon nothing. They loudly blame their neighbour's way of living, not for religion's sake, but out of envy because they can't endure to see another enjoy the pleasures age has weaned them from. There, to Elmir, that's a kind of rigmarole to please you. Daughter-in-law, one has never a chance to get her word in edgewise at your house, because this lady holds the floor all day. But none the less I mean to have my say, too. I tell you that my son did nothing wiser in all his life than take this godly man into his household. Heaven sent him here. In your great need to make you all repent, for your salvation you must hearken him. He censures nothing but deserves his censure. These visits, these assemblies, and these balls are all inventions by evil spirits. You never hear a word of godliness at them, but idle cackle, nonsense, flim-flam. Our neighbour often comes in him for a share. The talk flies fast, and scandal fills the air, and makes a sober person's head go around. At this assembly is just to hear the sound of so much gab with not a word to say. And as a learned man remarked one day, most aptly, this is the Tower of Babylon, where all beyond all limits babble on. And just to tell you how this point came in. To Cleon. So, now the gentleman must nicker, must he? Go find fools like yourself to make you laugh, and don't. To Elmir. Daughter, good-bye, not one word more. As for this house, I leave the half and said, but I shan't soon set foot in it again. Cuffing Flippot. Come, you, what makes you dream and stand the gate? Hussy, I'll warm your ears in proper shape. March, Trollop, march. Scene two. Cleon, Doreen. I won't escort her down, for fear she might fall foul of me again, the good old lady. Bless us! What a pity she shouldn't hear the way you speak of her. She'd surely tell you you're too good by half, and that she's not so old as all that, neither. How she got angry with us, all for nothing, and how she seems possessed with her tartuff. Her case is nothing, though, beside her son's. To see him, you would say he's ten times worse. 
his conduct in our late unpleasantness had won him such esteem and proved his courage in service of his king but now he's like a man besotted since he's been so taken with this tartuffe he calls him brother loves him a hundred times as much as mother son daughter and wife he tells him all his secrets and lets him guide his acts and rule his conscience he fondles and embraces him a sweetheart could not i think be loved more tenderly at table he must have the seat of honour while with delight our master sees him eat as much as six men could we must give up the choicest tidbits to him if he belches tis a servant speaking master exclaims god bless you oh he dotes upon him he's his universe his hero he's lost in constant admiration quotes him on all occasions takes his trifling acts for wonders and his words for oracles the fellow knows his dupe and makes the most aunt he fools him with a hundred masks of virtue gets money from him all the time by canting and takes upon himself to carp at us even his silly coxcomb of a lackey makes it his business to instruct us too he comes with rolling eyes to preach at us and throws away our ribbons rouge and patches the wretch the other day tore up a kerchief that he had found pressed in the golden legend calling it a horrid crime for us to mingle the devil's finery with holy things scene three elmire marianne damis cleon dorine elmire to cleon you're very lucky to have missed the speech she gave us at the door i see my husband is home again he hasn't seen me yet so i'll go up and wait till he comes in and i to save time will await him here i'll merely say good morning and be gone scene four cleon damis dorine i wish you'd say a word to him about my sister's marriage i suspect tartuf opposes it and puts my father up to all these wretched shifts you know besides how nearly i'm concerned in it myself if love unites my sister and valere i love his sister too and if this marriage were he's to he's coming scene five organ cleot dorine ah good morning brother i was just going but i'm glad to greet you things are not far advanced yet in the country dorine to cleon uh, just w- wait a bit please brother-in-law let me allay my first anxiety by asking news about the family to dorine has everything gone well these last two days what's happening and how is everybody madam had fever and a splitting headache day before yesterday all day and evening and how about tartuffe tartuffe he's well he's mighty well stout fat fair rosy-lipped poor man at evening she had nausea and couldn't touch a single thing for supper her headache still was so severe and how about tartuffe he supped alone before her and unctuously ate up two partridges as well as half a leg of mutton devilled poor man all night she couldn't get a wink of sleep the fever racked her so and we had to sit up with her till daylight how about tartuffe gently inclined to slumber he left the table went into his room got himself straight into a good warm bed and slept quite undisturbed until next morning poor man at last she let us all persuade her and got up courage to be bled and then she was relieved at once and how about tartuffe he plucked up courage properly bravely entrenched his soul against all evils and to replace the blood that she had lost he drank at breakfast four huge draughts of wine poor man so now they both are doing well and i'll go straight away and inform my mistress how pleased you are at her recovery scene six organ cleon brother she ridicules you to your face and i though i don't want to make you angry must tell you candidly that she is quite right was such infatuation ever heard of and can a man to-day have charms to make you forget all else relieve his poverty give him a home and then stop there good brother you do not know the man you are speaking of since you will have it so i do not know him but after all to tell what sort of a man he is dear brother 
you'd be charmed to know him your raptures over him would have no end he is a man who ah uh, in fact a man who whoever does his will knows perfect peace and counts the whole world else as so much dung his converse has transformed me quite he weans my heart from every friendship teaches me to have no love for anything on earth and i could see my brother children mother and wife all die and never care a snap your feelings are humane i must say brother ah if you'd seen him as i saw him first you would have loved him just as much as i he came to church each day with contrite mien kneeled on both knees right opposite my place and drew the eyes of all the congregation to watch the fervor of his prayers to heaven with deep-drawn sighs and great ejaculations he humbly kissed the earth at every moment and when i left the church he ran before me to give me holy water at the door i learned his poverty and who he was by questioning his servant who is like him and gave him gifts but in his modesty he always wanted to return a part it's too much he'd say oh too much by half i'm not worthy of your pity then when i refused to take it back he'd go before my eyes and give it to the poor at length heaven bade me to take him to my home and since that day all seems to prosper here he censures everything and for my sake he even takes great interest in my wife he lets me know who ogles her and seems six times as jealous as i am myself you'd not believe how far his zeal can go he calls himself a sinner just for trifles the merest nothing is enough to shock him so much so that the other day i heard him accuse himself for having while at prayer in too much anger caught and killed a flea zounds brother you are mad i think or else you are making sport of me with such a speech what are you driving at with all this nonsense brother your language smacks of atheism and i suspect your soul's a little tainted therewith i've preached to you a score of times that you'll draw down some judgment on your head that is the usual strain of all your kind they must have every one as blind as they they call you atheists if you have good eyes and if you don't adore their vain grimaces you've neither faith nor care for sacred things no no such talk can't frighten me i know what i'm saying heaven sees my heart we are not the dupes of all your canting murmurs there are false heroes and false devotees and as true heroes never are the ones who make much noise about their deeds of honor just so true devotees whom we should follow are not the ones who make so much vain show what will you find no difference between hypocrisy and genuine devoutness and will you treat them both alike and pay the self-same honor both to masks and faces set artifice beside sincerity confuse the semblance with reality esteem a phantom like a living person and counterfeit as good as honest coin men for the most part are strange creatures truly you never find keep the golden mean the limits of good sense too narrow for them must always be passed by in each direction they often spoil the noblest things because they go too far and push them to extremes i merely say this by the way good brother you are the sole expounder of the doctrine wisdom shall die with you no doubt good brother you are the only wise the soul enlightened the oracle the cato of our age all men compared to you are downright fools i am not the sole expounder of the doctrine 
and wisdom shall not die with me, good brother. But this I know, though it be all my knowledge, that there is a difference twixt false and true. And as I find no hero more to be admired than men of true religion, nothing more noble or more beautiful than is the holy zeal of true devoutness, just so I think there is not more odious than whited sepulchres of outward unction. Those barefaced charlatans, those hireling zealots, whose sacrilegious, treacherous pretense deceives at will and with impunity makes mockery of all that men hold sacred, men who, enslaved to selfish interests, make trade and merchandise of godliness and try to purchase influence and office with false eye rollings and affected raptures, those men, I say, who with uncommon zeal seek their own fortunes on the road to heaven, who, skilled in prayer, have always much to ask and live at court to preach retirement, who reconcile religion with their vices, are quick to anger, vengeful, faithless, tricky, and to destroy a man will have their boldness, to call their private crutch the cause of heaven, all the more dangerous, since in their anger they use against us weapons men revere, and since they make the world applaud their passion and seek to stab us with a sacred sword, there are too many of this scanting kind. Still, the sincere are easy to distinguish, and many splendid patterns may be found. In our own time, therefore, our very eyes look at Ariston, Periandre, Orante, Alcidamas, Clitandre, and Polydore. No one denies their claim to true religion, yet they are no braggadocio of virtue, they do not make insufferable display, and their religion is human, tractable. They are not always judging all our actions. They think such judgment savoured of presumption and leaving pride of words to other men. This, by their deeds alone, they censure ours. Evil appearances find little credit with them. They are even inclined to think the best of others. No cabalers, no intriguers, they mind the business of their own right living. They don't attack a sinner tooth and nail, for since the only object of their hatred. Nor are they overzealous to attempt far more in heaven's behalf than heaven would have had them. That is my kind of man. That is true living. That is the pattern we should set ourselves. Your fellow was not fashioned on this model. You are quite sincere in boasting of his zeal, but you are deceived, I think, by false pretenses. My dear good brother-in-law, have you quite done? Yes. I'm your humble servant. Starts to go. Just a word. We'll drop that other subject. But you know, Valerie has had the promise of your daughter. Yes. You had named the happy day. Tis true. Then why put off the celebration of it? I can't say. Can you have some other plan in mind? Perhaps. You mean to break your word? I don't say that. I hope no obstacle can keep you from performing what you have promised. Well, that depends. Why must you beat about? Valerie has sent me here to settle matters. Heaven be praised. What answer shall I take him? Why, anything you please. But we must know your plans. What are they? I shall do the will of heaven. Come, be serious. You have given your promise to Valerie. Now, will you keep it? Goodbye. Alone. His love, methinks, has much to fear. I must go. Let him know what's happening here. End of Act One. Act Two of Tartuffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tartuffe or the Hypocrite by Moliere. Act Two. Scene One. Organ Marianne. Now, Marianne. Yes, father. Come, I'll tell you a secret. Yes. What are you looking for? Orgon looking into a small closet room. To 
who see there's no one there to spy upon us. That little closet's mighty fit to hide in. There. We're all right now. Marion, in you I've always found a daughter, dutiful and gentle. So I've always loved you dearly. I'm grateful for your fatherly affection. Well spoken, daughter. Now, prove you deserve it by doing as I wish in all respects. To do so is the height of my ambition. Excellent well. What say you of Tartuffe? Who? I? Yes, you. Look to how you answer. Why, I'll say of him anything you please. Scene two. Orgon, Marianne, Doreen, coming in quietly and standing behind Orgon so that he does not see her. Well spoken, a good girl. Say then, my daughter, that all his person shines with noble merit, that he has won your heart and you would like to have him, by my choice, become your husband, eh? Eh? What say you? Please, what did you say? What? Surely I mistook you, sir. How now? Who is it, father, you would have me say has won my heart, and I would like to have become my husband by your choice? Tartuffe! But, father, I protest it isn't true. Why should you make me tell this dreadful lie? Because I mean to have it to be the truth. Let this suffice for you. I've settled it. What, father? You would— Yes, child, I'm resolved to grant Tartuffe into my family, so he must be your husband. That I've settled, and since your duty— Seeing Doreen. What are you doing here? Your curiosity is keen, my girl, to make you come eavesdropping on us so. Upon my word, I don't know how the rumour got started. If twas guesswork, or mere chance— but I had heard already of this match, and treated it as utter stuff and nonsense. What? Is this thing incredible? So much so, I don't believe it even from yourself, sir. I know a way to make you credit it. No, no, you're telling us a fairy tale. I'm telling you just what will happen shortly. Stuff. Daughter, what I say is in good earnest. There, there, don't take your father seriously. He's fooling. But I tell you— No, no use. They won't believe you. If I let my anger— Well, then, we do believe you, and the worst for you it is. <laughs> what? Can a grown-up man with that expanse of beard across his face be mad enough to want— You hark me! You've taken on yourself here in this house a sort of free familiarity that I don't like. I tell you frankly, girl— there, there, let's not get angry, sir, I beg you. But are you making game of everybody? Your daughter's not cut out for bigot's meat, and he has more important things to think of. Besides, what can you gain by such a match? How can a man of wealth, like you, go choose a wretched vagabond for son-in-law? You hold your tongue! I know the less he has, the better cause we have to honour him. His poverty is honest poverty. It should exalt him more than worldly grandeur, for he has let himself be robbed of all through careless disregard of temporal things and fixed attachment to the things eternal. My help may set him on his feet again, win back his property, a fair estate he has at home, so I'm informed, and prove him for what he is, a true-born gentleman. Yes, so he says himself. Such vanity, but ill accords with pious living, sir. The man who cares for holiness alone should not so loudly boast his name and birth. The humble ways of genuine devoutness brook not so much display of earthly pride. Why should he be so vain? But I offend you. Let's leave his rank, then. Take the man himself. Can you, without compunction, give a man like him possession of a girl like her think what a scandal sure to come of it virtue is at the mercy of the fates when a girl's married to a man she hates the best intent to live an honest woman depends upon the husband's being human 
and men whose brows are pointed at afar may thank themselves their wives are what they are for to be true is more than woman can with husbands built upon a certain plan and he who weds his child against her will owes heaven account for it if she do ill think then what perils wait on your design to marianne so i must learn what's what from her you see you might do worse than follow my advice daughter we can't waste time upon this nonsense i know what's good for you and i'm your father true i had promised you to young valere but first they tell me he's inclined to gamble and then i fear his faith is not quite sound i haven't noticed that he's regular at church you'd have him run there just when you do like those who go on purpose to be seen i don't ask your opinion on the matter in short the other is in heaven's best graces and that is riches quite beyond compare this match will bring you every joy you long for twill be all steeped in sweetness and delight you'll live together in your faithful loves like two sweet children like two turtle doves you'll never fail to quarrel scold or tease and you may do with him whatever you please with him do not but give him horns i warrant out on thee witch i tell you he's cut out for it however great your daughter's virtue sir his destiny is sure to prove the stronger have done with interrupting hold your tongue don't poke your nose in other people's business she keeps interrupting him just as he turns and starts to speak to his daughter if i make bold sir tis for your own good you're too officious pray you hold your tongue tis love of you i want none of your love then i will love you in your own despite you will eh yes your honour's dear to me i can't endure to see you made the butt of all men's ridicule won't you be still twould be a sin to let you make this match won't you be still i say you impudent viper what you are pious and you lose your temper i am all wrought up with your confounded nonsense now once and for all i tell you to hold your tongue then mum's the word i'll take it out in thinking think all you please but not a syllable to me about it or you understand turning to his daughter as a wise father i've considered all with due deliberation i'll go mad if i can't speak she stops the instant he turns his head though he's no ladies man tartuffe is well enough a pretty fizz so that although you may not care at all for his best qualities a handsome dowry Orgon turns and stands in front of her, with arms folded, eyeing her. Were I in her place, any man should rue it who married me by force. That's mighty certain. I let him know, and that within a week, a woman's vengeance isn't far to seek. To Doreen. So, nothing that I say has any weight. Eh? What's wrong now? I didn't speak to you. What were you doing? Talking to myself. Oh, very well. Aside. Her monstrous impudence must be chastised with one good slap in the face. He stands ready to strike her, and each time he speaks to his daughter, he glances toward her. But she stands still and says not a word. Daughter, you must approve of my design. Think of this husband I have chosen for you. To Doreen. Why don't you talk to yourself? Nothing to say. One little word more. Oh, no thanks. Not now. Sure, I'd have caught you. Faith, I'm no such fool. So, daughter, now, obedience is the word. You must accept my choice with reverence. Doreen running away. You'd never catch me marrying such a creature. Swinging his hand at her and missing her. Daughter, you've such a pestilent hussy there. I can't live with her any longer without sin. I can't discuss things in the state I'm in. My mind is so flustered by her insolent talk. To calm myself, I must go take a walk. Scene three, Marianne, Doreen. Say, have you lost the tongue from out your head? And must I speak your role from A to Z? You let them broach a project that's absurd, and don't oppose it with a single word. What can I do? My father is the master. Do? Everything to ward off such disaster. But what? Tell him one doesn't love by proxy. Tell him you'll marry for yourself, not him. Since you're the one for whom the thing is done, you are the one, not he, the man must please. 
if his tartuffe has charmed him so why let him just marry him himself no one will hinder a father's rights are such it seems to me that i could never dare to say a word come talk it out valere has asked your hand now do you love him pray or do you not doreen how can you wrong my love so much and ask me such a question have i not a hundred times laid bare my heart to you do you know how ardently i love him how do i know if heart and words agree and if in honest truth you really love him doreen you wrong me greatly if you doubt it i've shown my inmost feelings all too plainly so then you love him yes devotedly and he returns your love apparently i think so and you both alike are eager to be well married to each other surely then what's your plan about this other match oh, to kill myself if it is forced upon me good that's a remedy i hadn't thought of just die and everything will be all right this medicine is marvellous indeed it drives me mad to hear folk talk such nonsense oh dear doreen you get in such a temper you have no sympathy for people's troubles i have no sympathy when folk talk nonsense and flatten out as you do at a pinch but what can you expect if one is timid but what is love worth if it has no courage am i not constant in my love for him is not his place to win me from my father but if your father is a crazy fool and quite bewitched with his tartuffe and breaks his bounden word is that your lover's fault but shall i publicly refuse and scorn this match and make it plain that i'm in love shall i cast off for him whate'er he be womanly modesty and filial duty you ask me to display my love in public no no i ask you nothing you shall be mr tartuffe's why now i think of it i should be wrong to turn you from this marriage what cause can i have to oppose your wishes so fine a match an excellent good match mr tartuffe oh ho no mean proposal mr tartuffe sure take it all in all is not a man to sneeze at oh by no means tis no small luck to be his happy spouse the whole world joins to sing his praise already he's noble in his parish handsome too red ears and high complexion oh my lud you'll be happy sure with him for husband oh dear what joy and pride will fill your heart to be the bride of such a handsome fellow oh stop i beg you try to find some way to help break off the match i quite give in i'm ready to do anything you say no no a daughter must obey her father though he should want to make her wed a monkey besides your fate is fine what could be better you'll take the stage-coach to his little village and find it full of uncles and of cousins whose conversation will delight you then you'll be presented in their best society you'll even go to call by way of welcome on mrs bailiff mrs tax collector who'll patronize you with a folding stool there once a year at carnival you'll have perhaps a ball with orchestra two bagpipes and sometimes a trained ape and punch and duty though if your husband oh you'll kill me please contrive to help me out with your advice i thank you kindly oh doreen i beg you to serve you right this marriage must go through dear girl no if i say i love valere no no tartuffe's your man and you shall taste him you know i've always trusted you now help me no you shall be my faith tartuffified well then since you've no pity for my fate let me take counsel only of despair it will advise and help and give me courage there's one sure cure i know for all my troubles she starts to go there there come back i can't be angry long i must take pity on you after all oh don't you see doreen if i must bear this martyrdom i certainly shall die now don't you fret we'll surely find some way to hinder this but here's valere your lover Scene four, Valere, Marianne, Doreen. Madam, a piece of news, quite new to me, has just come out, and very fine it is. What piece of news? Your marriage with Tartuffe. Tis true. My father has this plan in mind. Your father, madam? Yes. He's changed his plans, and did but now propose it to me. 
What? Seriously? Yes, he was serious and openly insisted on the match. And what's your resolution in the matter, madam? I don't know. That's a pretty answer. You don't know? No. No? What do you advise? I? My advice is marry him, by all means. That's your advice? Yes. Do you mean it? Surely. A splendid choice, and worthy of your acceptance. Oh, very well, sir. I shall take your counsel. You'll find no trouble taking it, I warrant. No more than you did giving it, be sure. I gave it, truly, to oblige you, madam. And I shall take it to oblige you, sir. Doreen withdrawing to the back of the stage. Let's see what this affair will come to. So, that is your love? And it was all deceit when you— I beg you, say no more of that. You told me squarely, sir, I should accept the husband that is offered me. And I will tell you squarely that I mean to do so, since you have given me this good advice. Don't shield yourself with talk of my advice. You had your mind made up, that's evident. And now you're snatching at a trifling pretext to justify the breaking of your word. Exactly so. Of course it is. Your heart has never known true love for me. Alas! You're free to think so if you please. Yes, yes, I'm free to think so, and my outraged love may yet forestall you in your perfidy, and offer elsewhere both my heart and hand. No doubt of it. The love your high deserts may win. Good Lord, have done with my deserts. I know I have but few, and you have proved it. But I may find more kindness in another. I know of someone who will not be ashamed to take your leavings and make up my loss. The loss is not so great. You'll easily console yourself completely for this change. I'll try my best, that you may well believe. When we're forgotten by a woman's heart, our pride is challenged. We, too, must forget. Or if we cannot, must at least pretend to. No other way can men such baseness prove, as be a lover scorned and still in love. In faith, a high and noble sentiment. Yes, and it's one that all men must approve. What? Would you have me keep my love alive, and see you fly into another's arms before my very eyes, and never offer to someone else the heart that you had scorned? Oh, no, indeed. For my part, I could wish that it were done already. What? You wish it? Yes. This is insult heaped on injury. I'll go at once and do as you desire. He takes a step or two, as if to go away. Oh, very well, then. Turning back. But remember this. "'Twas you that drove me to this desperate pass. "'Of course.' "'Turning back again. "'And in the plan that I have formed, I only follow your example.' "'Yes.' "'At the door. "'Enough. You shall be punctually obeyed.' "'So much the better.' "'Coming back again. "'This is once for all.' "'So be it, then.' "'He goes toward the door, but just as he reaches it, turns around. "'Eh?' "'What?' "'You didn't call me?' "'I?' You are dreaming. Very well. I'm gone. Madam, farewell. He walks slowly away. Farewell, sir. I must say you've lost your senses and both gone clean daft. I've let you fight it out to the end of the chapter to see how far the thing could go. Oh, ho there, Mr. Valea. She goes and seizes him by the arm to stop him. He makes a great show of resistance. What do you want, Doreen? Come here. No, no, I'm quite beside myself. Don't hinder me from doing as she wishes. Stop! No. You see, I'm fixed, resolved, determined. So? Aside. Since my presence pains him, makes him go, I'd better go myself and leave him free. Now the other. Leaving Valere and running after Marianne. Where are you going? Let me be. Come back. No. No, it isn't any use. Aside. Tis clear the sight of me is torture to her. No doubt twere better I should free her from it. Same thing again. Leaving Marianne and running after Valere. Deuce take you both, I say. Now stop your fooling. Come here, you. And you. She pulls first one, then the other, toward the middle of the stage. To Doreen. What's your idea? To Doreen. What can you mean to do? Set you to rights and pull you out of the scrape. To Valere. Are you quite mad to quarrel with her now? Didn't you hear the things she said to me? To Marianne. Are you quite mad to get in such a passion? Didn't you see the way he treated me? 
fools, both of you. To Valere. She thinks of nothing else but to keep faith with you. I vouch for it. To Marianne. And he loves none but you, and longs for nothing but just to marry you. I stake my life on it. To Valere. Why did you give me such advice then, pray? Why ask for my advice on such a matter? You both are daft, I tell you. Here, your hands. To Valere. Come, yours. Giving Doreen his hand. What for? To Marianne. Now, yours. Giving Doreen her hand. But what's the use? Oh, quick now, come along. There, both of you. You love each other better than you think. Valère and Marianne hold each other's hands some time without looking at each other. Come. At last turning toward Marianne. Don't be so ungracious now about it. Look at a man as if you didn't hate him. Marianne looks sideways toward Valère with just a bit of a smile. My faith and troth, what fools these lovers be! To Marianne. But come now, have I not a just complaint? And truly, are you not a wicked creature to take delight in saying what would pain me? And are you not yourself the most ungrateful? Leave this discussion till another time. Now, think how you'll stave off this plaguy marriage. Then tell us how to go about it. Well, we'll try all sorts of ways. To Marianne. Your father's daft. To Valère. This plan is nonsense. To Marianne. You had better humour his notions by a semblance of consent, so that in case of danger you can still find means to block the marriage by delay. If you gain time, the rest is easy, trust me. One day you'll fool them with a sudden illness, causing delay. Another day, ill omens. You've met a funeral, or broke a mirror, or dreamed of muddy water. Best of all, they cannot marry you to anyone without your saying yes. But now, methinks, they mustn't find you chattering together. To Valère. You, go at once and set your friends at work to make him keep his word to you, while we will bring the brother's influence to bear and get the stepmother on our side too. Goodbye. To Marianne. Whatever efforts we may make, my greatest hope, be sure, must rest on you. I cannot answer for my father's whims. But no one save Valère shall ever have me. You thrill me through with joy. Whatever comes. Oh ho, these lovers, never done with prattling. Now go. Starting to go and coming back again. One last word. What a gabble and pother. Be off. By this door you, and you by the other. She pushes them off by the shoulders in opposite directions. End of Act Two. Act Three of Tartuffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tartuffe or the Hypocrite by Moliere. Act Three. Scene One. Damis Doreen. May lightning strike me dead this very instant. May I be everywhere proclaimed a scoundrel. If any reverence or power shall stop me, and if I don't do straight away something desperate. I beg you, moderate this towering passion. Your father did but merely mention it. Not all things that are talked of turn to facts. The road is long sometimes, from plans to acts. No, I must end this paltry fellow's plots, and he shall hear from me a truth or two. So ho, go slow now. Just you leave the fellow, your father too, in your stepmother's hands. She has some influence with this Tartuffe. He makes a point of heeding all she says and I suspect that he is fond of her. Would God twere true! Twould be the height of humour. Now she has sent for him, in your behalf, to sound him on this marriage, to find out what his ideas are, and to show him plainly what troubles he may cause, if he persists in giving countenance to this design. His man says he's at prayers, I mustn't see him, but likewise says he'll presently be down. So off with you, and let me wait for him. I may be present at this interview. No, no, they must be left alone. I won't. So much as speak to him. Go on. We know you and your high tantrums. Just the way to spoil things. Be off. No, I must see. I'll keep my temper. Out on you. What a plague. He's coming. Hide. Damas goes and hides in the closet at the back of the stage. Scene 2. Tartuffe Doreen. Tartuffe, speaking to his valet off the stage, as soon as he sees Doreen is there. Laurent, 
put up my haircloth shirt and scourge, and pray that heaven may shed its light upon you. If any come to see me, say I'm gone to share my alms among the prisoners. Doreen aside. What affectation and what showing off. What do you want with me? To tell you. Ah! Taking a handkerchief from his pocket. Before you speak, pray take this handkerchief. What? Cover up that bosom, which I can't endure to look on. Things like that offend our souls, and fill our minds with sinful thoughts. Are you so tender to temptation, then, and has the flesh such power upon your senses? I don't know how you get in such a heat. For my part, I am not so prone to lust, and I could see you stripped from head to foot, and all your hide not tempt me in the least. Show in your speech some little modesty, or I must instantly take leave of you. No, no, I'll leave you to yourself. I've only one thing to say. Madam will soon be down, and begs the favour of a word with you. Ah, willingly. Aside. How gentle all at once. My faith, I still believe I've hit upon it. Will she come soon? I think I hear her now. Yes, here she is herself. I'll leave you with her. Scene three. Elmir, Tartuffe. May heaven's overflowing kindness ever give you good health of body and of soul and bless your days according to the wishes and prayers of its most humble votary. I am very grateful for your pious wishes, but let's sit down so we may talk at ease. After sitting down. And how are you recovered from your illness? Sitting down also. Quite well. The fever soon let go its hold. My prayers, I fear, have not sufficient merit to have drawn down this favor from on high. But each entreaty that I made to heaven had for its object your recovery. You're too solicitous on my behalf. We could not cherish your dear health too much. I would have given mine to help restore it. Oh, that's pushing Christian charity too far. I owe you many thanks for so much kindness. I do far less for you than you deserve. There is a matter that I wish to speak of in private. I am glad there is no one here to listen. Madam, I am overjoyed. Tis sweet to find myself alone with you. This is an opportunity I've asked of heaven many a time, till now in vain. All that I wish is just a word from you, quite frank and open, hiding nothing from me. Damis, without their seeing him, opens the closet door halfway. I too could wish, as heaven's especial favor, to lay my soul quite open to your eyes, and swear to you the trouble that I made about those visits which your charms attract does not result from any hatred towards you, but rather from a passionate devotion and purest motives. That is how I take it. I think tis my salvation that concerns you. Madam, pressing her fingertips, tis so, and such is my devotion. Ouch! But you squeeze too hard. Excess of zeal. In no way could I ever mean to hurt you, and I'd as soon— He puts his hand on her knee. What's your hand doing there? Feeling your gown. The stuff is very soft. Let be, I beg you. I am very ticklish. She moves her chair away, and Tartuffe brings his nearer. Dear me, how wonderful in workmanship this lace is. Handling the lace yoke of Elmir's dress. They do marvels nowadays. Things of all kinds were never better made. Yes, very true. But let us come to business. They say my husband means to break his word and marry Marianne to you. Is it so? He did hint some such thing. But truly, madam, that's not the happiness I'm yearning after. I see elsewhere the sweet compelling charms of such a joy as fills my every wish. You mean you cannot love terrestrial things? The heart within my bosom is not stone. I well believe your sighs all tend to heaven, and nothing here below can stay your thoughts. Love for the beauty of eternal things cannot destroy our love for earthly beauty. Our mortal senses well may be entranced by perfect works that heaven has fashioned here. Its charms reflected shine in such as you, and in yourself, its rarest miracles. It has displayed such marvels in your face, that eyes are dazed, and hearts are rapt away. I could not look on you, the perfect creature, without admiring nature's great creator, and feeling all my heart inflamed with love for you, his fairest image of himself. At first I trembled, lest this secret love might be the evil spirit's artful snare. I even schooled my heart to flee your beauty, thinking it was a bar to my salvation. But soon, enlightened, O oh, all lovely one, I saw how this my passion may be blameless, how I may make it fit with modesty, 
and thus completely yield my heart to it. "'Tis I must own a great presumption in me to dare make you the offer of my heart. My love hopes all things from your perfect goodness, and nothing from my own poor weak endeavor. You are my hope, my stay, my peace of heart. On you depends my torment, or my bliss. And by your doom of judgment, I shall be blessed, if you will, or damned by your decree. Your declarations turned most gallantly, but truly it is just a bit surprising. You should have better armed your heart, methinks, and taken thought somewhat on such a matter, a pious man like you known everywhere. Though pious, I am none the less a man, and when a man beholds your heavenly charms, the heart surrenders, and can think no more. I know such words seem strange coming from me, but, madam, I'm no angel after all. If you condemn my frankly made avowal, you only have your charming self to blame. Soon as I saw your more than human beauty, you were thenceforth the sovereign of my soul. Sweetness ineffable was in your eyes, that took by storm my still resisting heart, and conquered everything, fasts, prayers, and tears, and turned my worship wholly to yourself. My looks, my sighs, have spoke a thousand times. Now, to express it all, my voice must speak. If but you will look down with gracious favor upon the sorrows of your worthless slave, if in your goodness you will give me comfort and condescend unto my nothingness, I'll ever pay you, O oh sweet miracle, an unexampled worship and devotion. Then, too, with me your honor runs no risk. With me you need not fear a public scandal. Those court gallants that women are so fond of are boastful of their acts and vain in speech. They always brag in public of their progress. Soon as a favor's granted, they'll divulge it. Their tattling tongues, if you but trust to them, will foul the altar where their hearts have worshipped. But men like me are so discreet in love that you may trust their lasting secrecy. The care we take to guard our own good name may fully guarantee the one we love. So you may find, with hearts like ours sincere, love without scandal, pleasure without fear. I've heard you through. Your speech is clear, at least. But don't you fear that I may take a fancy to tell my husband of your gallant passion, and that a prompt report of this affair may somewhat change the friendship which he bears you? I know that you are too good and generous, that you will pardon my temerity, excuse upon the score of human frailty the violence of passion that offends you, and not forget, when you consult your mirror, that I'm not blind, and man is made of flesh." Some women might do otherwise, perhaps, but I am willing to employ discretion, and not repeat the matter to my husband, but in return I'll ask one thing of you, that you urge forward, frankly and sincerely, the marriage of Valère to Marianne, that you give up the unjust influence by which you hope to win another's rights, and that— Scene 4. Elmire, Damas, Tartuffe. No, I say. Coming out of the closet-room where he had been hiding— this thing must be made public. I was just there, and overheard it all, and heaven's goodness must have brought me there, on purpose to confound the scoundrel's pride, and grant me means to take a signal vengeance, on his hypocrisy and arrogance, and undeceive my father, showing up the rascal, caught in making love to you. No, no, it is enough if he reforms, endeavouring to deserve the favour shown him. And since I promise, do not you belie me. Tis not my way to make a public scandal. An honest wife will scorn to heed such follies, and never fret her husband's ears with them. You have reasons of your own for acting thus, and I have mine for doing it otherwise. To spare him now would be a mockery. His bigot's pride has triumphed all too long over my righteous anger, and has caused far too much trouble in our family. The rascal, all too long, has ruled my father, and crossed my sister's love, and mine as well. The traitor now must be unmasked before him, and Providence has given me means to do it. To heaven I owe the opportunity, and if I did not use it now, I have it, I should deserve to lose it once for all. Demise. No, by your leave. I'll not be counselled. I'm overjoyed. You needn't try to tell me I must give up the pleasure of revenge. I'll make an end of this affair at once. And, to content me, where is my father now? Scene 5. Organ, Elmir, Damas, Tartuffe. Father, we have news to welcome your arrival. That's altogether novel and surprising. 
You are well paid for your caressing care, and this fine gentleman rewards your love most handsomely with zeal that seeks no less than your dishonour, as has now been proven. I have just surprised him making to your wife the shameful offer of a guilty love. She, somewhat over gentle and discreet, insisted that the thing should be concealed, but I will not condone such shamelessness, nor so far wrong you as to keep it secret. Yes, I believe a wife should never trouble her husband's peace of mind with such vain gossip. A woman's honour does not hang on telling. It is enough if she defend herself, or so I think. Demise, you'd not have spoken if you would but have heeded my advice. Scene six. Organ, Damis, Tartuffe. Just heaven! Can what I hear be credited? Yes, brother. I am wicked. I am guilty. A miserable sinner. Steeped in evil. The greatest criminal that ever lived. Each moment of my life is stained with soilers, and all but a mass of crime and filth. Heaven, for my punishment, I see it plainly, would mortify me now. Whatever wrong they find to charge me with, I'll not deny it, but guard against the pride of self-defense. Believe their stories, arm your wrath against me, and drive me like a villain from your house. I cannot have so great a share of shame, but what I have deserved a greater still. Orgon to his son. You miscreant! Can you dare with such falsehood to try to stain the whiteness of his virtue. What? The fiend meekness of this hypocrite makes you discredit- Silence! Cursed plague! Ah, let him speak. You chide him wrongfully. You'd do far better to believe his tales. Why favor me so much in such a matter? How can you know of what I'm capable? And should you trust my outward semblance, brother, or judge therefrom that I'm the better man? No, no, you let appearances deceive you. I'm anything but what I'm thought to be. Alas! And though all men believe me godly, the simple truth is, I'm a worthless creature. To Damis. Yes, my dear son, say on, and call me traitor, abandoned scoundrel, thief, and murderer. Heap on me names yet more detestable, and I shall not gainsay you. I have deserved them. I'll bear this ignominy on my knees, to expiate in shame the crimes I've done. To Tartuffe. Ah, oh, brother! "'Tis too much!" To his son. "'You'll not relent, you blackguard!' "'What? His talk can so deceive you?' "'Silence, you scoundrel!' To Tartuffe. "'Brother, rise, I beg you!' To his son. "'Infamous villain!' "'Can he?' "'Silence!' "'What?' "'Another word, I'll break your every bone!' "'Brother, in God's name, don't be angry with him. I'd rather bear myself the bitterest torture then have him get a scratch on my account. To his son. Ungrateful monster. Stop! Upon my knees I beg you pardon him. Alas! Throwing himself on his knees too and embracing Tartuffe. How can you? To his son. Villain, behold his goodness. So? Be still. What? I? Be still, I say. I know your motives for this attack. You hate him. All of you, wife, children, servants, all that loose upon him, you have recourse to every shameful trick to drive this godly man out of my house. The more you strive to rid yourselves of him, the more I'll strive to make him stay with me. I'll have him straight away married to my daughter, just to confound the pride of all of you. What? Will you force her to accept his hand? Yes! and this very evening to enrage you, young rascal. Ah, I'll brave you all. I'll show you that I'm the master, and I must be obeyed. Now, down upon your knees this instant, rogue, and take back what you said, and ask his pardon. Who? I? Ask pardon of the cheating scoundrel? You resist, you beggar, and insult him? A cudgel here! A cudgel! To Tartuffe. Don't restrain me. To his son. Off with you. Leave my house this instant, Sirrah, and never dare set foot in it again. Yes, I will leave your house, but... Leave it quickly, you reprobate. I disinherit you, and give you, too, my curse into the bargain. Scene 7. Orgon, Tartuffe. What? So insult a saintly man of God. Heaven. Forgive him all the pain he gives me. To Orgon. 
could you but know with what distress i see them try to vilify me to my brother oh. the mere thought of such ingratitude makes my soul suffer torture bitterly my horror at it ah my heart so full i cannot speak i think i'll die of it scoundrel in tears running to the door through which he drove away his son i wish i'd never let you go but slain you on the spot with my own hand to tartuffe brother compose yourself and don't be angry nay brother let us end those painful quarrels i see what troublous times i bring upon you and think tis needful that i leave this house what y you can't mean it yes they hate me here and try i find to make you doubt my faith what of it do you find i listen to them no doubt they won't stop there these same reports you now reject may some day win a hearing no brother never ah my friend a woman may easily mislead her husband's mind no no so let me quickly go away and thus remove all cause for such attacks no you shall stay my life depends upon it then i must mortify myself and yet if you should wish no never very well then no more of that but i shall rule my conduct to fit the case honor is delicate and friendship binds me to forestall suspicion prevent all scandal and avoid your wife no you shall haunt her just to spite them all tis my delight to set them in a rage you shall be seen together at all hours and what is more the better to defy them i'll have no other heir but you and straightway i'll go and make a deed of gift to you drawn in due form of all my property a true good friend my son-in-law to be is more to me than son and wife and kindred will you accept my offer will you not heavens will be done in everything poor man we'll go make haste to draw the deed aright and then let envy burst itself with spite end of act three act four of tartuffe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Tartuffe or the Hypocrite by Moliere Act 4 Scene 1 Cléant Tartuffe Yes, it's become the talk of the town, and make a stir that's scarcely to your credit. And I have met you, sir, most opportunely, to tell you in a word my frank opinion, not to sift out this scandal to the bottom. Suppose the worst for us, suppose Damis acted the traitor, and accuse you falsely should not a christian pardon this offence and stifle in his heart all wish for vengeance should you permit that for your petty squabble a son be driven from his father's house i tell you yet again and tell you frankly every one high or low is scandalized if you'll take my advice you'll make it up and not push matters to extremities make sacrifice to god of your resentment Restore the son to favor with his father. Alas, so far as I'm concerned, how gladly would I do so. I bear him no ill will. I pardon all, lay nothing to his charge, and wish with all my heart that I might serve him. But heaven's interest cannot allow it. If he returns, then I must leave the house. After his conduct, quite unparalleled, all intercourse between us would bring scandal. God knows what everyone's first thought would be. They would attribute it to merest scheming on my part. Say that, conscious of my guilt, I feigned a Christian love for my accuser, but feared him in my heart, and hoped to win him and underhandedly secure his silence. You try to put us off with specious phrases, but all your arguments are too far-fetched. Why take upon yourself the cause of heaven? Does heaven need our help to punish sinners? Leave to itself the care of its own vengeance and keep in mind the pardon it commands us besides think somewhat less of men's opinions when you are following the will of heaven shall petty fear of what the world may think prevent the doing of a noble deed no let us always do as heaven commands and not perplex our brains with further questions 
Already I have told you I forgive him, and that is doing, sir, as heaven commands. But after this day's scandal and affront, heaven does not order me to live with him. And does it order you to lend your ear to what mere whim suggested to his father, and to accept gift of his estates, on which in justice you can make no claim? No one who knows me, sir, can have the thought that I am acting from a selfish motive. The goods of this world have no charms for me. I am not dazzled by their treacherous glamour. And if I bring myself to take the gift which he insists on giving me, I do so, to tell the truth, only because I fear this whole estate may fall into bad hands, and those to whom it comes may use it ill, and not employ it, as is my design, for heaven's glory and my neighbor's good. Eh, sir? Give up these conscientious scruples, that well may cause a rightful heir's complaints. Don't take so much upon yourself, but let him possess what's his, at his own risk and peril. Consider it were better he misused it, than you should be accused of robbing him. I am astounded that unblushingly you could allow such offers to be made. Tell me, has true religion any maxim that teaches us to rob the lawful heir? If heaven has made it quite impossible, Damis and you should live together here. Were it not better, you should quietly and honorably withdraw, than let the sun be driven out for your sake, dead against all reason. It would be giving, sir, believe me, such an example of your probity. Sir, it is half-past three. Certain devotions recall me to my closet. You'll forgive me for leaving you so soon. Cleon alone. Ah! Scene two. Almir, Marianne, Cleon, Doreen. Doreen to Cleon. Sir, we beg you to help us all you can in her behalf. She's suffering almost more than heart can bear. This match her father means to make tonight drives her each moment to despair. He's coming. Let us unite our efforts now. We beg you, and try by strength or skill to change his purpose. Scene three. Orgon, Elmir, Marianne, Cleon. Doreen. So ho! I'm glad to find you all together. To Marianne. Here is the contract that shall make you happy, my dear. You know already what it means. Marianne on her knees before Orgon. Father, I beg you, in the name of heaven that knows my grief, and by what e'er can move you, relax a little your paternal rights and free my love from this obedience. Oh, do not make me, by your harsh command, complain to heaven you ever were my father. Do not make wretched this poor life you gave me. If crossing that fond hope which I had formed, you'll not permit me to belong to one whom I have dared to love, at least I beg you, upon my knees, oh, save me from the torment of being possessed by one whom I abhor. And do not drive me to some desperate act by exercising all your rights upon me. Orgon, a little touched. Come, come, my heart, be firm. No human weakness. I am not jealous of your love for him. Display it freely. Give him your estate. And if that's not enough, add all of mine. I willingly agree and give it up, if only you'll not give him me, your daughter. Oh, rather let a convent's rigid rule wear out the wretched days that heaven allots me. These girls are ninnies always turning nuns when fathers thwart their silly love affairs. Get on your feet! The more you hate to have him, the more it will help you earn your soul's salvation. So mortify your senses by this marriage, and don't vex a bee about it any more. But what? You hold your tongue before your betters. Don't dare to say a single word, I tell you! If you will let me answer and advice... Brother, I value your advice most highly. Tis well thought out. No better can be had, but you will allow me not to follow it. Elmir to her husband. I can't find words to cope with such a case. Your blindness makes me quite astounded at you. You are bewitched with him to disbelieve the things we tell you happened here today. I am your humble servant, and can see things when they're plain as noses on folks' faces. I know you're partial to my rascal son and didn't dare to disavow the trick he tried to play on this poor man. Besides, you were too calm to be believed. If that had happened, you'd have been far more disturbed. And must our honor always rush to arms at the mere mention of illicit love? 
or can we answer no attack upon it except with blazing eyes and lips of scorn? For my part, I just laugh away such nonsense. I've no desire to make allowed to do. Our virtue should, I think, be gentle-natured. Nor can I quite approve those savage prudes whose honour arms itself with teeth and claws to tear men's eyes out at the slightest word. Heaven preserve me from that kind of honour. I like my virtue not to be a vixen, and I believe a quiet, cold rebuff no less effective to a repulse a lover. I know. And you can't throw me off the scent. Once more I am astounded at your weakness. I wonder what your unbelief would answer if I should let you see we've told the truth. See it? Yes. Nonsense. Come, if I should find a way to make you see it clear as day. All rubbish. What a man. But answer me. I'm not proposing now that you believe us. But let's suppose that here, from proper hiding, you should be made to see and hear all plainly. What would you say then to your man of virtue? Why then, I'd say... Say nothing. It can't be. Your error has endured too long already, and quite too long you've branded me a liar. I must at once, for my own satisfaction, make you a witness of the things we've told you. Amen. I'll take you at your word. We'll see what tricks you have, and how you'll keep your promise. To Doreen. Send him to me. To Elmir. The man's a crafty codger. Perhaps you'll find it difficult to catch him. To Doreen. Oh, no, a lover's never hard to cheat, and self-conceit leads straight to self-deceit. Bid him come down to me. To Cleon and Marianne. And you, withdraw. Scene four, Elmir, Orgon. Bring up this table and get under it. What? One essential is to hide you well. Why under there? Oh, dear, do as I say. I know what I'm about, as you shall see. Get under now, I tell you, and once there be careful no one either sees or hears you. I'm going a long way to humour you, I must say, but I'll see you through your scheme. And then you'll have, I think, no more to say. To her husband, who is now under the table. But mind, I'm going to meddle with strange matters. Prepare yourself to be in no wise shocked. Whatever I may say must pass, because tis only to convince you as I promised— by wheedling speeches, since I'm forced to do it, I'll make this hypocrite put off his mask, flatter the longings of his shameless passion, and give free play to all his impudence. But, since tis for your sake to prove to you his guilt that I shall feign to share his love, I can leave off as soon as you're convinced, and things shall go no farther than you choose. So— when you think they've gone quite far enough, it is for you to stop his mad pursuit, to spare your wife, and not expose me farther than you shall need yourself to undeceive you. It is your own affair, and you must end it when— Here he comes. Keep still. Don't show yourself. Scene 5. Tartuffe, Elmir, Orgon under the table. They told me that you wished to see me here. Yes. I have secrets for your ear alone. But shut the door first, and look everywhere for fear of spies. Tartuffe goes and closes the door, and comes back. We surely can't afford another scene like that we had just now. Was ever anyone so caught before? Demiste had frightened me most terribly on your account. You saw I did my best to baffle his design and calm his anger. But I was so confused, I never thought to contradict his story. Still... Thank heaven, things turned out all the better as it happened, and now we're on an even safer footing. The high esteem you're held in laid the storm. My husband can have no suspicion of you, and even insists, to spite the scandal-mongers, that we shall be together constantly. So that is how, without the risk of blame, I can be here locked up with you alone, and can reveal to you my heart perhaps only too ready to allow your passion. Your words are somewhat hard to understand, madam. Just now you used a different style. If that refusal has offended you, how little do you know a woman's heart? How ill you guess what it would have you know when it presents so feeble a defense? Always at first our modesty resists the tender feelings you inspire us with. 
Whatever cause we find to justify the love that masters us, we still must feel some little shame in owning it, and strive to make as though we would not, when we would. But from the very way we go about it, we let a lover know our heart surrenders, the while our lips, for honour's sake, oppose our heart's desire, and in refusing, promise. I'm telling you my secret all too freely, and with too little heed to modesty. But now that I've made bold to speak, pray tell me, should I have tried to keep Demise from speaking? Should I have heard the offer of your heart so quietly, and suffered all your pleading, and taken it just as I did, remember? If such a declaration had not pleased me, and when I tried my utmost to persuade you not to accept the marriage that was talked of, what should my earnestness have hinted to you if not the interest that you've inspired? And my chagrin should such a match compel me to share a heart I want all to myself. Tis, past a doubt, the height of happiness, to hear such words from lips we dote upon. Their honeyed sweetness pours through all my senses, long draughts of suavity ineffable. My heart employs its utmost zeal to please you, and counts your love its one beatitude. And yet that heart must beg that you allow it to doubt a little its felicity. I well might think those words an honest trick to make me break off this approaching marriage. And if I may express myself quite plainly, I cannot trust these two enchanting words until the granting of some little favor I sigh for shall assure me of their truth, and build within my soul, on firm foundations, a lasting faith in your sweet charity. Coughing to draw her husband's attention. <coughs> what? Must you go so fast, and all at once exhaust the whole love of a woman's heart? She does herself the violence to make this dear confession of her love, and you are not yet satisfied, and will not be without the granting of her utmost favours. The less a blessing is deserved, the less we dare to hope for it, and words alone can ill assuage our love's desires. A fate too full of happiness seems doubtful still. We must enjoy it ere we can believe it. And I, who know how little I deserve your goodness, doubt the fortunes of my daring. So I shall trust to nothing, madam, till you have convinced my love by something real. Ah, how your love enacts the tyrant's role and throws my mind into a strange confusion. With what fierce sway it rules a conquered heart, and violently will have its wishes granted. What, is there no escape from your pursuit? No respite even, not a breathing space. Nay, is it decent to be so exacting and so abused by urgency, the weakness you may discover in a woman's heart? But if my worship wins your gracious favour, then why refuse me some sure proof thereof? But how can I consent to what you wish, without offending heaven you talk so much of? If heaven is all that stands now in my way, I'll easily remove that little hindrance, your heart need not hold back for such a trifle. But they affright us so with heaven's commands. I can dispel these foolish fears, dear madam. I know the art of pacifying scruples. Heaven forbids, tis true, some satisfactions. But we find means to make things right with heaven. There is a science, madam, that instructs us how to enlarge the limits of our conscience according to our various occasions, and rectify the evil of the deed according to our purity of motive. I'll duly teach you all these secrets, madam. You only need to let yourself be guided. Content my wishes. Have no fear at all. I'll answer for it, and take the sin upon me. <coughs> Your cough is very bad. Yes, I'm in torture. Would you accept this piece of licorice? The case is obstinate, I find. And all the licorice in the world will do no good. "'Tis very trying." "'More than words can say." "'In any case, your scruples easily removed. With me, you're sure of secrecy. And there's no harm unless a thing is known. The public scandal is what brings offense, and secret sinning is not sin at all." <coughs> <coughs> "'So then, I see I must resolve to yield. I must consent to grant you everything, and cannot hope to give full satisfaction, or win full confidence at lesser cost. No doubt tis very hard to come to this, 
"'Tis quite against my will I go so far. But since I must be forced to it, since nothing that can be said suffices for belief, since more convincing proof is still demanded, I must make up my mind to humour people. If my consent give reason for offence, so much the worse for him who forced me to it. The fault can surely not be counted mine. It need not, madam, and the thing itself— Open the door, I pray you, and just see whether my husband's not there, in the hall. Why take such care for him? Between ourselves, he is a man to lead round by the nose. He's capable of glorying in our meetings. I've fooled him so, he'd see all, and deny it. No matter, go, I beg you, look about, and carefully examine every corner. Scene 6. Orgon, Elmir. That is— Crawling out from under the table. I own a man abominable. I can't get over it. The whole thing floors me. What? You come out so soon. You cannot mean it. Get back under the table. Tis not time yet. Wait till the end to see and make quite certain. And don't believe a thing on mere conjecture. Nothing more wicked e'er came out of hell. Dear me, don't go and credit things too lightly. No, let yourself be thoroughly convinced. Don't yield too soon for fear you'll be mistaken. As Tartuffe enters, she makes her husband stand behind her. Scene 7. Tartuffe, Elmir, Orgon. Tartuffe not seeing Orgon. All things conspire towards my satisfaction. Madam, I've searched the whole apartment through. There's no one here, and now my ravaged soul— Softly! You are too eager in your amours. You needn't be so passionate. Aha! My holy man, you want to put it on me. How is your soul abandoned to temptation? Marry my daughter, eh? You want my wife, too? I doubted long enough if this was earnest, expecting all the time the tone would change. But now the proof's been carried far enough. I'm satisfied, and ask no more for my part. To Tartuffe. Twas quite against my character to play this part, but I was forced to treat you so. What? You believe? Come now, no protestations. Get out from here, and make no fuss about it. But my intent... That talk is out of season. You leave my house this instant. You're the one to leave it, you who play the master here. This house belongs to me, I'll have you know, and show you plainly it's no use to turn to these low tricks to pick a quarrel with me, and that you can't insult me at your pleasure, for I have wherewith to compound your lies, avenge offended heaven, and compel those to repent who talk to me of leaving. Scene 8. Elmir, Oregon. What sort of speech is this? What can it mean? My faith, I'm dazed. This is no laughing matter. What? From his words I see my great mistake. The deed of gift is one thing troubles me. The deed of gift? Yes, that is past recall. But I've another thing to make me anxious. What's that? You shall know all. But see at once whether a certain box is still upstairs. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Tartuffe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tartuffe or the Hypocrite by Moliere. Act 5. Scene 1. Orgon, Cleon. Is it away so fast? How should I know? Methinks we should begin by taking counsel to see what can be done to meet the case. I'm all worked up about that wretched box. More than all else, it drives me to despair. That box must hide some mighty mystery. Argas, my friend who is in trouble, brought it to me himself, most secretly, and left it with me. He chose me in his exile for this trust, and on these documents, from what he said, I judge his life and property depend. How could you trust them to another's hands? By reason of a conscientious scruple. I went straight to my traitor, to confide in him, his sophistry made me believe that I must give the box to him to keep, so that in case of search, I might deny my having it at all, and still, by favor of this evasion, keep my conscience clear, even in taking oath against the truth. Your case is bad. So far as I can see, this deed of gift, this trusting of the secret to him, were both, to state my frank opinion, steps that you took too lightly. He can lead you to any length with these four hostages, 
and since he holds you at such disadvantage, you would be still more imprudent to provoke him. So you must go some gentler way about. What? Can a soul so base, a heart so false, hide neath the semblance of such touching fervor? I took him in, a vagabond, a beggar. Tis too much. No more pious folk for me. I shall abhor them utterly for ever, and henceforth treat them worse than any devil. So, there you go again, quite off the handle. In nothing do you keep an even temper. You never know what treason is, but always jump first to one extreme and then the other. You see your error, and you recognize that you have been cozened by a fiend zeal. But to make up for it in the name of reason, why should you plunge into a worse mistake and find no difference in character between a worthless camp and all good people? What? Just because a rascal boldly duped you with pompous show of false austerity? Must you needs have it everybody's like him, and no one's truly peers nowadays. Leave such conclusions to mere infidels. Distinguish virtue from its counterfeit. Don't give esteem too quickly at a venture, but try to keep in this the golden mean, if you can help it. Don't uphold imposture, but do not rail at true devoutness either. And if you must fall into one extreme, then rather err again the other way scene two damas organ cleon what father can the scoundrel threaten you forget the many benefits received and in his base abominable pride make of your very favours arms against you too true my son it tortures me to think on it let me alone i'll chop his ears off for him we must deal roundly with his insolence it is i must free you from him at a blow it is I, to set things right, must strike him down. Spoke like a true young man. Now just come down and moderate your towering tantrums, will you? We live in such an age, with such a king, that violence cannot advance our cause. Scene 3. Madame Purnell, Organ, Elmire, Cleon, Marianne, Damis, Doreen. What's this? I have fearful mysteries. Strange things indeed for my own eyes to witness. You see, I am requited for my kindness. I zealously receive a wretched beggar. I lodge him, entertain him like my brother, load him with benefactions every day, give him my daughter, give him all my fortune. And meanwhile, the villain, rascal, wretch, tries with black treason to suborn my wife and not content with such a foul design, he dares to menace me with my own favours, and would make use of those advantages which, to my foolish kindness, armed him with, to ruin me, take my fortune from me, and leave me in the state I saved him from. Poor man! My son, I cannot possibly believe he could incend so black a deed. What? Wealthy men are still the sports of envy. Mother, what do you mean by such a speech? There are strange going ons about your house, and everybody knows your people hate him. What's that to do with what I tell you now? I always said, my son, when you were little, that the virtue here below is hated ever. That envious may die, but envy never. What's that fine speech to do with present facts? Be sure, they forge a hundred silly lies. I told you once. I saw it all myself. For slanderers abound in calumnies. Mother, you'd make me damn my soul. I tell you. I saw with my own eyes his shamelessness. Their tongues for spitting venom never lack. There's nothing here below they'll not attack. Your speech has not a single grain of sense. I saw it, hark ye, saw it with these eyes. I saw, do you know what saw means? Must I say it a hundred times and din it in your ears? My dear, appearances are all deceiving. And seeing shouldn't always be believing. I'll go mad. Full suspicions might delude. And good to evil oft is misconstrued. Must I construe as Christian charity the wish to kiss my wife? He must, at least, have just foundation for accusing people, and wait until he see a thing for sure. The devil! How could I see any sure? Should I have waited till before my eyes? He... No, you'll make me say things quite improper. In short, this known to pure as ill inflames him, and so we cannot possibly conceive that he should try to do its charge against him. If you were not my mother, I should say such things. I know not what. 
I'm so enraged. Doreen to Orgon. Fortune has paid you fair to be so doubted. You flouted our report, now yours is flouted. We are wasting time here in the merest trifling which we should rather use in taking measures to guard ourselves against the scoundrel's threats. You think his impudence could go far? For one, I can't believe it possible. Why, his ingratitude would be too patent. Don't trust to that. He'll find abundant warrant to give good colour to his acts against you, and for less cause than his a stone cabal can make one's life a labyrinth of troubles. I tell you once again, armed as he is, you never should have pushed him quite so far. True. Yet what could I do? The rascal's pride made me lose all control of my resentment. I wish with all my heart that some pretense of peace could be patched up between you two. If I had known what weapons he was armed with, I never should have raised such an alarm, and my— Who's coming now? To Doreen, seeing Mr. Loyal come in. Go quick, find out. I'm in a fine state to receive a visit. Scene 4. Orgon, Madame Purnell, Elmire, Marianne, Cleont, Damis, Doreen, Mr. Loyal. Mr. Loyal to Doreen at the back of the stage. Good day, good sister. Pray you, let me see the master of the house. He's occupied. I think he can see nobody at present. I'm not by way of being unwelcome here. My coming can, I think, no wise displease him. My errand will be found to his advantage. Your name, then? Tell him simply that his friend, Mr. Tartuffe, has sent me for his goods. It is a man who comes with civil manners. Sent by Tartuffe, he says, upon an errand that you'll be pleased with. Cleon to Orgon. Surely you must see him, and find out who he is, and what he wants. Orgon to Cleon. Perhaps he's come to make it up between us. How shall I treat him? You must not get angry, and if he talks of reconciliation, accept it. Sir. To Orgon. Good day, and heaven send harm to your enemies. Favor to you. Aside to Cleon. This mild beginning suits with my conjectures, and promises some compromise already. All of your house has long been dear to me. I had the honor, sir, to serve your father. Sir, I am much ashamed, and ask your pardon for not recalling now your face or name. My name is Loyal. I'm from Normandy. My office is court bailiff. In despite of envy, and for forty years, thank heaven, it's been my fortune to perform that office with honour. So I've come, sir, by your leave, to render service of a certain writ. What? You're here to— Pray, sir, don't be angry. Tis nothing, sir, but just a little summons. Order to vacate, you and yours, this house. Move out your furniture. Make room for others, and that without delay or putting off as needs must be i leave this house yes please sir the house is now as you well know of course mr tartuffe's and he beyond dispute of all your goods is henceforth lord and master by virtue of a contract here attached drawn in due form and unassailable your insolence is monstrous and astounding i have no business sir that touches you pointing to Orgon. This is the gentleman. He's fair and courteous, and knows too well a gentleman's behavior to wish, in any wise, to question justice. But— Sir, I know you would not for a million wish to rebel. Like a good citizen, you let me put in force the court's decree. Your long black gown may well, before you know it, Mr. Code Bailiff, get a thorough beating. Sir— To Orgon. Make your son be silent, or withdraw. I should be loath to have to set things down, and see your names inscribed in my report. Doreen aside. This Mr. Loyal's looks are most disloyal. I have much feeling for respectable and honest folk like you, sir, and consented to serve these papers only to oblige you, and thus prevent the choice of any other who, less possessed of zeal for you than I am, might order matters in less gentle fashion. And how could one do worse than order people out of their house? Why, we allow you time, and even will suspend, until tomorrow, the execution of the order, sir. I'll merely, without scandal, quietly come here and spend the night, 
with half a score of officers, and just for form's sake, please, you'll bring your keys to me before retiring. I will take care not to disturb your rest, and see there's no unseemly conduct here. But by tomorrow, and at early morning, you must make haste to move your least belongings. My men will help you. I have chosen strong ones to serve you, sir, in clearing out the house. No one could act more generously, I fancy, and, since I'm treating you with great indulgence, I'll beg you'll do as well by me, and see I'm not disturbed in my discharge of duty. I give this very minute, and not grudge it, the hundred best gold louis I have left, if I could just indulge myself, and land my fist for one good square one on his snout. Playant aside to Orgon. Careful. Don't make things fuss. Such insolence. I hardly can restrain myself. My hands are itching to be at him. By my faith, with such a fine broad back, Mr. Loyal, a little beating would become you well. My girl, such infamous words are actionable, and warrants can be issued against women. Enough of this discussion, sir. Have done. Give us the paper, and then leave us, pray. Then, au revoir. Heaven keep you from disaster. May heaven confound you both, you and your master. Scene 5. Orgon, Madame Purnell, Elmire, Cléant, Marianne, Domus, Doreen. Well, mother, am I right or am I not? This writ may help you now to judge the matter. Or don't you see his treason even yet? I'm all amazed, befuddled, beflustered. Doreen to Orgon. You are quite wrong. You have no right to blame him. This action only proves his good intentions. Love for his neighbour makes his virtue perfect. And knowing money is a root of evil, in Christian charity he'd take away whatever things may hinder your salvation. Be still. You always need to have that told you. Cléant to Orgon. Come. Let us see what course you are to follow. Go and expose his bold ingratitude. Such action must invalidate the contract. His perfidy must now appear too black to bring him the success that he expects. Scene 6. Valère, Orgon, Madame Purnell, Elmire, Cléant, Marianne, Damis, Doreen. Tis with regret, sir, that I bring bad news, but urgent danger forces me to do so. A close and intimate friend of mine, who knows the interest I take in what concerns you, has gone so far, for my sake, as to break the secrecy that's due to state affairs, and sent me word but now that leaves you only the one expedient of sudden flight. The villain who so long imposed upon you found means an hour ago to see the prince, and to accuse you, among other things, by putting in his hands the private strong box of a state criminal whose guilty secret you, failing in your duty as a subject, he says, have kept. I know no more of it save that a warrant's drawn against you, sir, and for the greater surety, that same rascal comes with the officer who must arrest you. His rights are armed, and this is how the scoundrel seeks to secure the property he claims. Man is a wicked animal, I'll own it. The least delay may still be fatal, sir. I have my carriage and a thousand louis provided for your journey at the door. Let's lose no time. The bolt is swift to strike, and such as only flight can save you from. I'll be your guide to seek a place of safety, and stay with you until you reach it, sir. How much I owe to your obliging care. Another time must serve to thank you fitly, and I pray heaven to grant me so much favor that I may some day recompense your service. Goodbye. See to it, all of you. Come, hurry. We'll see to everything that's needful, brother. Scene 7. Tartuffe, an officer, Madame Purnell, Orgon, Elmire, Cléant, Marianne, Valère, Damis, Doreen. Tartuffe, stopping Orgon. Softly, sir, softly. Do not run so fast. You haven't far to go to find your lodging. By order of the prince, we here arrest you. Traitor! You saved this worst stroke for the last. This crowns your perfidies and ruins me. I shall not be embittered by your insult, for heaven has taught me to endure all things. Your moderation, I must own, is great. How shamelessly the wretch makes bold with heaven. Your ravings cannot move me. All my thought 
is but to my duty. You must claim great glory from this honourable act. The act cannot be aught but honourable, coming from that high power which sends me here. Ungrateful wretch! Do you forget t'was I that rescued you from utter misery? I'll not forget some help you may have given, but my first duty now is towards my prince. The higher power of that most sacred claim must stifle in my heart all gratitude, and to such pussyant ties I'd sacrifice my friend, my wife, my kindred, and myself. The hypocrite! How well he knows the trick of cloaking him with what we most revere. But if the motive that you make parade of is perfect as you say, why should it wait to show itself until the day he caught you soliciting his wife? How happens it you have not thought to inform against him until his honour forces him to drive you out of his house? And though I need not mention that he just given you his whole estate, still, if you now meant to treat him now as guilty, how could you then consent to take his gift? Pray, sir, to the officer, deliver me from all this clamour. Be good enough to carry out your order. Yes, I have too long delayed its execution. Tis very fitting you should urge me to it. So, therefore, you must follow me at once, to prison, where you'll find your lodging ready. Who? I, sir? You. But why to prison? You are not the one to whom I own account. You, sir. To Orgon. Recover from your hot alarm. Our prince is not a friend to double dealing. His eyes can read men's inmost hearts, and all the art of hypocrisies cannot deceive him. His sharp discernment sees things clear and true. His mind cannot too easily be swayed, for reason always holds the balance even. He honours and exalts true piety, but knows the false, and views it with disgust. This fellow was by no means apt to fool him. Far subtler snares have failed against his wisdom, and his quick insight pierced immediately the hidden baseness of this tortuous heart. Accusing you, the knave betrayed himself, and by true recompense of heaven's justice he stood revealed before our monarch's eyes, a scoundrel, known before by other names, whose horrid crimes, detailed at length, might fill a long-drawn history of many volumes. Our monarch, to resolve you in a word, detesting his ingratitude and baseness, added this horror to his other crimes, and sent me hither under his direction, to see his insolence outtop itself, and force him then to give you satisfaction. Your papers, which the traitor says are his, I am to take from him and give you back. The deed of gift, transferring your estate, our monarch's sovereign will makes null and void, and for the secret personal offence your friend involved you in, he pardons you. Thus he rewards your recent zeal, displayed in helping to maintain his rights, and shows how well his heart, when it is least expected, knows how to recompense a noble deed, and will not let true merit miss its due, remembering always rather good than evil. Now heaven be praised! At last I breathe again. A happy outcome! Who'd have dared to hope it? Orgon to Tartuffe, who is being led by the officer. There, traitor! Now you're— Scene 8. Madame Purnell, Orgon, Elmire, Marianne, Cléant, Valère, Damis, Doreen. Brother, hold, and don't descend to such indignities. I beg you, leave the poor wretch to his unhappy fate, and let remorse oppress him, but not you. Hope, rather, that his heart may now return to virtue. Hate his vice reform his ways and win the pardon of our glorious prince while you must straight away go and on your knees repay with thanks his noble generous kindness well said we'll go and at his feet kneel down with joy to thank him for his goodness shown and this first duty done when honours due will then attend upon another too with wedded happiness reward valere and crown a lover noble and sincere end of act five end of tartuffe or the hypocrite by jean baptiste poquelon moliere translated by curtis hidden page